Um, guard just said he never follows magic. I feel privileged. I followed magic and manza. I heard a lot of laughing. <laughs> I wish I could have listened to what he had to say. Um, today, I want to talk about something a little bit different, about medicine, magic, manza, medicine, M&M. &M. Um, and the rest of it gets real serious, so, so try and laugh once in a while. But I'm a biologist, and I make my living following monkeys and apes in the jungles of Africa and Asia. Sounds like a tough job. I promised myself that when I got a job where I was pulled out until I got the job that didn't feel like a job. So I really don't feel like I'm working when I do my work. One of the things that I really love about what I do are these eureka moments where you spend days, months, even years sometimes painstakingly trying to pull pieces of data together to understand a, a, large, a, a larger picture. And it's at those times when, ah, everything comes together. And the picture that you've created is larger than the sum of any of the parts that you put together. And hopefully that will move on to even more ahas, bigger, bigger projects, bigger studies, and a greater understanding. And, but to really be successful in science, you have to publish. And to publish, you have to um, convince your peers who will say no or yes, whereas to your, your findings will be published, you have to convince them that it's something novel, it's something new, adds new information to science. Um, I should have switched this already, but I'm still in that thread. Okay. Um, so, but let's be honest, when, when we say we, we, for example, when we say we found a new species, I bet the monkey would be really surprised to learn that he's new. I'm sure he's, he realizes he's been around for a long time. So what we know, what we, we know as being novel or, or new in science, there's, there's a, a few different things that you have to think about. And to be honest, as humans, what we know is all based on our experiences as an individual, the country we're, we were born in, the, the culture we have, and even as a scientist, the discipline that we are trained in. People in different disciplines think that things have already been discovered, or think that things are old, or think that they don't exist. So sometimes we don't even communicate on the same level as scientists. Let me give you, well, I, I give you an example of the new species. Um, sometimes new species are being discovered, unfortunately, in the market, ready to be sold as meat. And these animals are not new to the local people. Often they're competing with them for, for resources. So the, the, the race is on for us to really try and document these species scientifically before they all disappear. Um, OK. Um, I would like to tell you about one of my aha, my eureka experiences. Um, and that is about self, animal self-medication. And my contribution as a primatologist to this new advancing area of science. Um, in 1987, I unexpectedly came upon a sick chimpanzee and was very curious as to what was going on. I followed it over the next, next day, and about 20 hours later, its behavior had changed dramatically. And so that started me on a completely different journey from what I had started when I originally went to the forest of Tanzania to, to, to study chimpanzees. And it's been a long journey, it's been a very productive journey, a very satisfying journey. Um, and at that point, I've, it's from that point, I've spent much of my career, one of the main topics that I've been studying is what makes animals sick, and what do they do to make themselves feel better? It seems like a very esoteric question, but I thought from that point that um, beyond the intrinsic scientific value of understanding how animals could possibly treat themselves, it could be beneficial to the conservation, to appeal to others how important, how valuable these animals may be. What can they have to teach us in the future? And of course, that could have implications directly for human health. My observations of that chimpanzee were the first um, scientific description, first scientifically described and analyzed observations of an animal, became sick, and recovered within 24 hours. Up until that time, people thought that there were folklores and anecdotal evidence of animals using medicine. But this was the first scientific documentation of that 
of that phenomena. Um, and so that set up a number of different international collaborations. And the plant that that, it, that that chimpanzee was using is called Vernonia amygdalina. Locally, it's called bitter leaf. And in the area where I did my research in western Tanzania, the Watongwe call it Mujonso. Um, and it's a very interesting plant. But, and and the, the, the local people, the Watongwe also use this plant as a medicine, a treatment for stomach upsets, for fever, for malaria, um, and as an antiseptic. So it, it seemed to be something going on here that, that, that was very, very curious. Um, but as all new discoveries go, rediscoveries go, it was a very humbling, humbling and inspiring um, event that I learned partway through my research that what I had rediscovered was that the Watongwe, these people who I lived and worked with for many years in Tanzania, they assumed, they already knew that animals when sick would self-medicate. And they would look to sick animals for new medicines to treat themselves. So here I thought I was, I was breaking new ground. And in that way, it was very comforting to know that, that I was on the right track. It was also very humbling to know that there are a lot of, of things out there that as scientists we should have known or we should have been more open to much earlier on. Um, and I, I came to learn only several years later, after, after the study was going on, that indeed many of the plants that the Watongwe use as their, their, their best treatments of the day were obtained by watching sick animals. Um, Vernonia is widely used as the, by the Watongwe for the exact same symptoms as the sick chimpanzee, and it needs other chimpanzees that I observed using the plant over the years. And they recover in the same period of time, about 20 hours. Exactly the same as we saw with the chimpanzees. So things were getting really, really interesting. And it was the first medicine originating from this observation of sick sick animals that Mohammed told me was this plant called Mulenga Lele. It's a member of the acacia family. It's a legume in, in, in the bean family. It's, a, it's a, small, a small bush about this big. And he told me that his grandfather first discovered this plant's medicinal properties by watching a young, ill, orphan porcupine, which he took back into the village. And one day, it tried to, to, to leave the village, so Mohammed's grandfather followed it into the forest and watched it dig up this root and chew on it. He was very surprised because Mulengalele had a name. They knew about it. It wasn't one of these new species. But they stayed away from it because it was very poisonous. When he saw this porcupine <coughs> chew up these roots and then get better within 20 hours later, he said, I've got to try this. And at the time, there was an epidemic of dysentery. And he was unable to treat the patients in his village with the plants that he'd already obtained. So he tried Mulengalele, and it worked. And interestingly, to this day, this, when, when this was found maybe 70 years ago, um, Mohammed is, is in his 60s himself, so his grandfather would be much, much older. And even today, traditional healers of the Watongwe tribe in the hinterlands of western Tanzania use Mulengalele. Now, they're using it to treat secondary infections from patients with AIDS, and Mohammedi uses it to treat people who have sexually transmitted infections. So it appears to be a very potent antibiotic. Now, as my research continued at Mahale in western Tanzania, we, we saw more examples of, of, the, of chimpanzees using Vernonia amygdalina and other plants. And I began to look at other species within Africa and study other primate species throughout Asia and indeed other mammal species. And as other scientists in this field became interested to do experimental work and to study other mammal species, birds as well, we be, we, it became clear that this wasn't just an isolated phenomenon, something that chimpanzees in Tanzania only do. Indeed, from ants to apes, all animals have some form of self-medication because everyone gets sick. You have to find a way to maintain that health. So I think that, that um, self-medication is nothing less than a very fundamental form of survival. It's, it's, an, um, it's, it's a product of a long, long um, evolutionary history. And I'm confident that in any species we try and look for, it, we will find examples of self-medication. Um, and in this way, I think the medicinal practice, practices of traditional humans 
are very linked to our animal origin. I make no claims that animal self-medication can compete with Western medicine, but I think it would be, we would be ill-advised to ignore millions of years of evolution shaping animals' behaviors to deal with some of the same illnesses that we have. And I think there's still a lot more to be learned from this type of study. Now, I'm going to go through the four fundamental types of self-medication that I think are going on in the animal kingdom that we know about today. The first is called passive, passive prevention. Um, it's difficult for animals to, to foresee that they're going to be sick in the future, so it's not a cognitive process. But what this entails is eating foods at certain times of the year when you're likely to be infected more with parasites that have anti-parasitic properties. We find this in humans, we find this in all kinds of animal species. In the primates that I've studied so far, 15 to 30 percent of the diet in any one population are plants with anti-parasitic properties. So I think, and the time that they use it, again, is the period when locally they're most likely to be reinfected by parasites. We've also done a study here in Japan on the Japanese monkeys, and what we found moving from north to south, that the, the population in the north tend to have fewer parasites. As you go south, they have more and more parasites. And as you go south, the, the groups also have more and more plants in their diet that have anti-parasitic properties. So something is going on, some selective pressure that's directing their diet towards preventing infection. The next stage is therapeutic self-medication, and this is like we, we take out an aspirin when we have a headache, when we take Pepto-Bismol when we have a stomach ache. This is a direct response to feeling ill. There's examples throughout the animal kingdom of this. It's Sometimes they're pharmacological properties, other times they're physical properties, like leaf swallowing, a behavior that we see where you, you take rough leaves, instead of chewing them, you swallow them whole, up to a hundred leaves at a time. And in six hours, all the parasites in your stomach of a certain species are flushed out. We see this happening in all the chimpanzees and gorillas in the wild across Africa. We also see it here in Asia in gibbons and Japanese monkeys sometimes. We see it in bears and leopards and wolves. Snow geese, even birds. Birds and li bears living in the same climate, in the same habitat, are using the same plant against the same parasite. That's amazing how different, so unrelated species have come to a common way of controlling disease. This third form is called um, body anointment, and it's like we use bug spray to keep, to keep the mosquitoes off. Animals use a number of different plants. They will rub it and chew on it and mix it with their saliva into their fur or into their feathers. Some animals take toxic insects and bite the insects that exude these poisons and then rub that in their fur. An interesting twist to this is orangutans in Sumatra will take a plant, a specific herb, chew on the leaves, rub it in their joints. And the local people there in Sumatra use the same plant to rub in their joints for arthritis. And I don't think there's too many orangutans watching people to learn how to do this. So something is, is going on. And the last group is called fumigation. And this is, um, it, it, it occurs above ground in nests or underground in, um, in burrows and things. And basically it's the same thing as putting it in your body, but you take leaves and you line your nest with these things. And they keep away biting, biting insects like lice, um, flies, fleas, things like that. And again, this is very widespread, reoccurring in so many different species of animals. And now I'd like to close with some, 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 some thoughts. I don't know how many of you have seen the movie Men in Black. It's, it's a funny movie. It's about uh, these, these special agents who are in charge of looking after the, the aliens from outer space, controlling their behavior, keeping tabs on them. And there was one one very interesting quote by Agent K, the senior guy who was training his young um, protege. And it goes like this. 1,500 years ago, people knew that the Earth was the center of the universe. 500 years ago, and this is true, 500 years ago, people thought that the Earth was flat. And maybe some of you, 18 minutes ago, knew that only humans had the ability to self-medicate. 
Imagine what we'll know tomorrow. I'm not at all against outer space exploration and, and looking for, um, for, for new things. But do we really need to go outside of the planet to find intelligence? I think not. Anyway, there was a slide with a lot of different animal species here on planet Earth. A lot of local talent, a lot of very smart beings on the planet that we still have so much to learn from. Um, and that's my message today. Thank you very much.